Hello everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Rita Wolfson. I am the founder of Financial Social Work and of the Financial Health and Wellness Professional Community. Also on this training is Linda Benjamin, our Relationship Manager. Want to say hi, Linda? Good afternoon, everybody. We're so glad you're here. Okay, Linda will be helping us out with a number of things throughout the training. And of course, our very wonderful and special Tiana Ingram. I am so excited that she is with us. She will tell you more about herself when we turn over this training to her. But you should know that she is on our board and that she is someone very special and you will get a lot out of this training from her today. I'd like to welcome you officially. Um, I'm glad you're here for your own sakes so you can always be learning more about improving your own financial future. And I'm glad you're here professionally to add new tools to your client toolbox. You can check the chat box for messages, although the person who usually helps us with our technology is not here right now, so there really won't be any messages there. We don't share slides, that's always requested, but they are proprietary. Uh, but the website, uh, the recording will be on the website and emailed to you. You can type your questions into the question box and we will answer as many as time permits. There are no CEs or certificates of attendance for this webinar, regrettably, but a lot of great content. So let's keep going. I'd like to begin our training by asking everyone to sit up and center yourself and do some deep breathing. We know that when we talk about money, it brings up a lot of thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, and it's important to feel centered and ready to learn. We'll begin with our financial social work affirmation that goes just for today. I will love myself enough to face my fears, practice self-acceptance, and embrace hope. I will silence my inner critic, speak my truth, and make peace with myself and with my past. Just for today, I will give myself permission to eliminate toxic people, beliefs, and behaviors from my life. And I will prepare for a better tomorrow by healing my relationship with my money and with myself today. I wrote that affirmation a couple of years ago. I believe that it summarizes all of the work that I've put into creating financial social work. So this year we've been starting our trainings with a picture and asking our attendees to share your answers in the question box. What does this picture make you think of? And Linda, our relationship manager, will be sharing your responses. And they're always so interesting and valuable to everyone on the call. So go ahead and tell us what this makes you think of. We have one very quick answer. Jewel said chess game. 
Ah, money is king, strategic financial planning, saving for the future. Who else? Come strategic on. Strategic money management, strategic saving for the future, shuffling money around to cover expenses. Mm. Mm -hmm. Money is strategy. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, everybody. Come on, you have a few more. Money yeah. games. Mm. Ha, those who have more money are the winners. Wow. This is such a favorite thing of mine. Come on, anybody else? Well, I don't Money is a game. Are you the king or queen of your money? Money <laughs> should be the money should be thought of carefully. Being in different financial places. Money is about making strategic moves. Financial management, maneuvering to be responsible with how I use money, thinking ahead for proper planning and financial success, savings goals. Moves makes make makes more or more or less money. Well, I don't play chess, but I think it takes a lot of time to learn the game. I'm always looking for an interesting photograph um, to share with you on these trainings. And my thinking of this picture was a lot like yours. Um, and thinking about all the time and practice that it takes both to learn to play chess and to learn to manage your money. So before we turn this over to Tiana, a lot of you are new to financial social work today since we have a wonderful registration and i thought i would share a little bit about why we do these monthly webinars and who we are we know that no one chooses to have money problems but unfortunately today more than ever most people do and that's where financial social work comes in it is the intersection of social work politics, the economy, gender, economic, and social justice, and all in equity. And we list just a few of those areas that we're talking about. Financial social work is a behavioral model because until and unless behavior changes, nothing changes. It's heavily psychosocial. It explores the financial thoughts, feelings, attitudes, beliefs, experiences, and values that we each have and that drive financial behavior. And that's how we earn, spend, save, share, and borrow. It's interactive, reflective, supportive, engaging strength based it's heavily authentically true social work it's holistic multidisciplinary hopeful and helpful it does it works beautifully individually and with groups and is heart centered we approach money in life from a perspective of healing acceptance courage wellness and honesty and the core of the work is about a relationship with money recognizing and taking ownership of that relationship for our financial health and our relationship with ourself it's about self-discovery self-care and self-healing We are in our 26th year of doing business, and we have thousands of graduates across this country and around the world, as you can see there. And now, it really does give me great pleasure, special pleasure to turn this over to our guest speaker today. Tiana, are you? Are you ready? 
I am ready. I am ready. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen and start this slideshow for you all. I'm so happy to be here, Rita. Thank you for the introduction. Um, today, we are going to be talking about disrupting the cycles of poverty and foster care using this financial, social, work, behavioral health model, which has transformed the way I think about money and had transformed the way my clients think about money. And I want to be able to share that with you all today. Um, first, a little bit about me. Um, I know my bio was up there a bit. Again, my name is Tiana Ingram. I'm an associate clinical social worker, a certified financial social worker, and also a certified financial education instructor. I'm a graduate of Howard University and received my master's in social work from USC. And working with families that have been impacted by the child welfare system has really been my life work. I've been doing it for over a decade now. Um, I'm also the founder of my own social, uh, spiritual, uh, social enterprise called the Tin Coins. And I currently serve as the program director for the Los Angeles chapter of um, a national program called Friends of the Children that is meant to uh, break the cycle of poverty and serving uh, by serving families impacted by foster care um, using the vehicle of paid professional mentorship. But all of that is like my professional background. Really, I'm just a black woman that is currently on my own financial healing journey and I continue to survive various challenges and I have made it my mission to really just walk alongside others as they do the same and has been an honor and I feel grateful to be able to do that. So today uh, we are going to be starting off sharing just the systemic financial issues in the child welfare system. We're gonna go into the financial problems for families in foster care, uh, then uh, speak about the financial problems for foster youth who are aging out of the foster care system, and then uh, jump into some key strategies and tips and tools so that you will all be able to partner with and support former foster youth to achieve their version of financial wellness. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with a poll. Let me go ahead, I'm gonna bring it up in one second, but just so you know some background information, um, Los Angeles County is the home to the largest foster care system in the entire country, um, which is huge. But according to statistics, black children only make up 7% of the county's entire child population. So my question to you all, is approximately what percentage of all children in LA County foster care system are black. So let me go ahead and launch this poll for you. And we'll give you a few minutes to, a few seconds to go ahead and respond. See them coming in, thank you. I'll leave it up for a few more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and close it. All right, let's see what you all share. So yes, the poll results, I see that most of you are thinking that highest number, the 34%, um, the correct answer is 24%, but I totally understand why you're saying that 34%. Either way, um, you know, we see that the black children are making up way more of the population in foster care than they are in the entire county. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing that for now, continue with it. When we see numbers like that, right, where the number is so low for how many children are in the county um, versus how many children are in the foster care system, that's called a disparity or disproportionality. And like many other systems in the US, um, like the criminal justice system, there's a huge racial disproportionality and disparity. And really that's just a result of systemic oppression and social inequities faced by black people in the United States. Um, oftentimes, um, people who have exper experienced systemic failures struggle with getting a good education the right job opportunities and access to resources that can lift them out of poverty, which really uh, creates a pipeline to being involved in these systems. 
And like we were just talking about poverty, poverty is actually a key indicator in involvement in the child welfare system. Typically when you, um, pretty much meaning if someone is poverty, they in poverty, they're way more likely to interact with the child welfare system. And it's a fact really, most families are getting reported to the foster care system due to financial issues, um, which can be a shock for some people. Most people are thinking that um, children are getting you know, severely abused or, different things like that. And yes, that's happening also, but the majority of families, um, again, according to a study by the US Department of Health and Human Services, neglect is the most common form of child maltreatment in the United States. And in, um, within the child welfare system, they categorize different types of neglect and physical neglect is one of those. And that actually most cases come in because of physical neglect. And really what physical neglect means is the parents are just unable to meet their children's basic needs. So that's providing adequate housing, food, and um, clothing for their child. And additionally, um, a part of that physical neglect too could be not having adequate supervision for their child um, or supervision at all. And all of those, when you think about that, right, just leads to just not having the funds and the finances to, to provide those things for your child. And some of you have may have already seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, which pretty much shares, right, in order for us to really get to the top and that area of just self-awareness, personal growth, and achieving that, that sense of wellness and well-being, um, it starts with getting our basic needs met, right, that food, water, shelter. And just like I was mentioning, you can't really do any of those, you can't really obtain any of those things uh, without money. And so, um, because a lot of these families again are not able to are not able to fund these things uh they're not able to actually reach their goals or it creates more more of an opportunity for them to be come, to come into contact with the department of children and family services is what we call it in los angeles or just child protective services so we got a little background right of just the systemic issues and what's leading and leading families to get involved in the foster care system. So what are these problems for families when they are currently in the foster care system? So many of the problems that, um, that they're having begin to just stack up against them. And the cycles of poverty and foster care persist once they're in the foster care system. So instead of, you know, we're removing children from their home and separating them, and we think that this is going to um, enhance the child well-being or the family well-being, it actually more problems begin to come once the child is in foster care. You know, not having money is stressful. I know that, you know, most of us, if, we, if any of us have ever been in that situation, we understand that. And so it's the same, right, for parents. When you're struggling with financial difficulties and worried about how you're going to feed your children at night, worried about if you're going to be able to uh, pay your rent the next month, um, it can really, it, it, it really, they, they can really struggle with that. It can damage their self-esteem. It makes them feel just worthless, like a bad parent. Um, it can create feelings of anger and just negatively impact how they're interacting in their families. Um, additionally, when, um, when reunification, uh, reunification becomes more difficult when families are struggling with their finances. So um, typically when a child um, is placed out of the home, um, the first step is for, uh, child Protective Services to so just offer an opportunity for that parent to reunify with their with their child, um, and they're they're requiring different different things. And so, typically, when when someone doesn't have money, there's a lot of barriers to getting your child back. Um, one of those is just barriers to transportation. If you're unable to pay for ride shares or um, public transportation, or if you have a car that's being getting broken, um, broke down, and you don't have the funds to fix it. Um, it can make it hard to make it to the visits to see your child um, and other mandatory appointments that is required by Child Protective Services. Um, it also, um, these parents also have a difficulty keeping a job due to scheduling conflicts. Um, the majority of these, these parents, because they um, are dealing with these um, inequities, um, are working entry level, minimum wage jobs, maybe on a part-time level. and um, you know, they don't have the benefits that uh, some of us have, right? And so they are not able to just call off work and get sick time or vacation time or just have the flexibility in their schedule. And so oftentimes they're having to decide between seeing their child um, and going to a visit or going to work. And more times than not, right, they're going to choose to see their child, which may lead them to losing their job. And 
you know, if you lose your job, you don't have money coming in. And so those problems continue. Again, that cycle is just persisting. Um, also, just due to just a lack of supportive housing options, in order to reunify with your child, you know, Child Protective Service is going to make sure that they have a safe and stable home to return to. But, um, you know, all across America, rent and housing is high, but especially in Los Angeles County, right, the, the cost of living is extremely high. And so trying to find supportive housing options for you to be able to, you know, afford your, your, your rent is, is hard. And so, the, again, problems continue to persist and the cycles continue uh, to persist. So I'm gonna get into um, sharing about Chrissy um, and we're gonna walk you through her story as I continue this presentation for you all. Um, Chrissy is 30 years old now. I've been working with her for several years and I'll just share a little bit of background and um, to, to her story and um, how, how where she is now and, and what we're working on today. So again, like I said, Chrissy's 30. She became involved in the foster care system when she was 11 years old. She is the oldest of four siblings. And um, her mom, you know, was a single mom and she was struggling with mental health issues really just due to the trauma that her mom experienced when she was a child and, you know, difficulties in not having adequate support to really navigate those mental health challenges. Um, because of those mental health challenges, because of just her lack of education, um, Chrissy's mom just really was working like odd in jobs just to like make ends meet. Um, and so she was working a swing shift and night shift um, at a restaurant doing some cleaning. And um, Chrissy, being the oldest child, was responsible for you know getting her children, uh, getting her siblings home from school. Um, figuring out something for dinner and putting them to bed at night while her mom was at work. And um, one day, Chrissy was just making some noodles on the stove and um, her six-year-old brother accidentally, you know, grabbed the, the pot and burnt his face with the boiling water. And so once they, um, you know, went to the hospital, uh, the hospital called um, the Department of Children and Family Services. Once the investigation happened, they realized that, you know, Chrissy as an 11 year old was caring for her four siblings um, regularly. Um, mom, you know, did not have a lot of food in the home to be able to, um, to be able to really care for them. Um, her housing was really uh, at risk uh, of losing and just uh, the, they, they determined that the family wasn't being supervised and cared for in the way that they uh, they should have been. So Chrissy and her three siblings were removed from the home because it's extremely difficult to find a home that is going to take four siblings at one time. Um, they were all split up from one another. Chrissy went from foster home to foster home, of course, really angry, confused, um, just feeling hurt about the situation, missing her siblings, missing you know her mom's situation. While it may not have seemed perfect to um, DCFS, you know, this is how they were used to living and they had a lot of love and support and care for one another. And so Chrissy ended up um, going from group home um, after, you know, when she reached a teenage years, the, your really only option is group homes. A lot of foster homes don't um, typically want to take a lot of teenagers. Um, you know, all throughout all that, Chrissy was extremely resilient and wanted to just graduate high school. And she she's met that goal at 18. She graduated high school, but um, a couple months after graduation, she became pregnant with her first child. Um, and so then she just, you know, obviously scared, um, but wanting to make sure that she she gave her child uh, better than what she had, she decided to keep the child and raise the child. And so um, like Chrissy, right, like we're sharing, um, more children are staying in foster care for longer periods of time, um, you know, uh, Oftentimes people think, okay, this parent is just losing their child for six, three to six months or a short amount of time. But because of all the issues that I was sharing with you before, um, you know, more children are, less children are reunifying with their parents and more children are staying. And a few children are exiting before they reach young adulthood, before they reach that 18. Um, transitional age youth is that 18 to 21, some in some states is to 25 year old age range. And so a um, few children are exiting before that. And the system is not uh, set up to raise children, right? They're, they're there to intervene and provide some child safety for a bit, but they're not set up to actually raise children. So these transitional age foster youth are not receiving adequate support and life skills in order for them to, you know, be able to be successful and thriving adults, you know, once they become adults. And 
due to that, um, a lot of these youth are experiencing high numbers of homelessness, under education and poverty when they age out the system and are required to start living on their own. So we have another poll for you. We're going to do a little game, True Truths and a Lie. So I want you to be able to share uh, with me which statement is false. Um, let me go ahead and launch this. So yes, one, um, teenage pregnancies um, among foster youth have reached epidemic levels. Um, teen pregnancy in the entire United States have been, their rates have been increasing since 1990. Or teenage girls in the foster care system are twice as likely to get pregnant before turning 19 than teenage girls who are not in foster care. Thank you for participating. We'll give it a few more seconds. Let's get a couple more votes in. We're pretty close. And we're saying which statement is false. So that may be confusing too. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. and share the results. It's kind of a trick question, requires a lot of a good reading for this, but um, so what's true is yes, it's teenage pregnancies in foster care have reached epidemic levels. So I see that the two, the two that you pick them, the top are the actual, the, the true answers um, is that, um, again, they reached epidemic levels and teenage girls in foster care are twice as likely to get pregnant before turning 19. Um, but however, while the numbers are increasing in foster care and they're at an epidemic level, um, the rates for their peers who are not in foster care have actually been decreasing in the U.S. since 1990. So you just see the difference between um, children who are in foster care and children who are not and um, what, what that can do um, as far as uh, teenage and young pregnancy. Thank you for participating. All right. So let's get into how we can really just support these um, partner with. Also, I always like to say partner. We're working alongside, walking alongside of them and supporting these former foster youth to achieve financial wellness. Um, first things first is we really just have to create that safe space um, for foster youth. Um, and that can mean a lot of things. Um, first, let, let's go back and share. It's not. Um, a lot of the Hi, Anna, we can't hear you anymore. Linda, can you hear? I cannot hear Tiana. Well, maybe she will go out and come back in again. Tyler was having um, technical difficulty. Um, we couldn't hear her before uh, we started. But let me see. We have her slides. So let me see. Well, now we don't. Okay, so I can um, continue with her training. Not that I want to because I don't, and she knows it much better than I do, but here we go. So it is important, so important to, and Linda, if Tiana comes back on, let's grab her again. Um, oh, sure. Uh, to create a safe space where people, students, young people can unpack their money wounds and embrace their money story. And youth, everyone today actually needs the skills. They need to learn how to get out of debt, build savings, 
and accumulate long-term assets that allow for healing growth and creating lasting financial change. So you know, we can't see your screen. You can't see it? Not your, no, uh-uh, your slides. Um, oh, okay, that's, that's what you told me. Uh, let's see if I can fix that. Okay, so I need to take back the slides. Okay. Um, okay, sharing. Okay. I got it. Okay, thanks, Linda. Show my screen. Okay. Um, push this back and we can keep going. Okay. Is that better, Linda? Yes. Yes. Thank you for being there. Okay. We want to equip youth that are aging out uh, to be able to take control of their financial health and wellness. Until you take control of your money, you can never feel or actually be in control of your life, regardless of who you are, or where you are. And we want to equip them with the tools they need to become financially secure, economically sufficient, and better prepared to weather financial hard times. So what is financial wellness? There are lots of definitions. If you have a definition of your own, you can go ahead and share it with us uh, in chat, and Linda can share some of those. But here's Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. I called in. Okay. So do you want, I'll keep advancing them and. You yeah. Can. Okay. Go ahead, Diana. Okay. Thank you so much. I apologize for that. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but yes, I. I here um, right now, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, what is financial wellness? What are we really trying to help these foster youth in order um, to achieve, right? And so, again, I heard Rita, you think you're definitely welcome to put your own definitions in there, but really reminding ourselves that financial wellness is just about how you think and feel um, about money. Um, you know, what thoughts come up when you think about money? Are you getting Sick to your stomach, you know, or are you getting really excited about like your financial future when you think about money? And so we're wanting um, foster youth to understand that too, what that definition is, and um, how before we even start to helping them to achieve that, we can go ahead and advance. Um, and so by gaining financial wellness, you'll be able to confidently take action towards your version of financial freedom. Um, those keywords here, right, are your version. We want to make sure that um, former foster are able to create their own version. Everyone has a different version of what financial freedom is. If you see right here, I've, I've made it a bit of an acronym um, for us to remember the different ways in order that we can walk alongside from a false youth and help them achieve that. We can go ahead and advance. Um, and so I'm gonna walk, go ahead and walk you through all of these different steps here. Um, each, each letter stands for something different. Um, like I was mentioning earlier, it's really not a linear process to healing to achieve financial wellness. Um, you know, some steps you may be working on simultaneously, some steps you'll have to work on for the entirety of while you're working with these foster youth um, and some steps uh, you'll just work on for a short amount of time or it'll take you some time to get there. So you want to remember that. Um, but the step um, F is we'll go ahead and advance the next slide and I'll, I'll be able to share each one as we're going there. So F, forgive yourself. Really um, focus on the present. Um, this is this is big, right, for our foster youth to really help them to like let go of past mistakes and fear of failure. Um, oftentimes, they've been through so many different things um, they've made. Um, you know, when I we talk about Chrissy, right? Um, you know, as 
as determined and motivated she was to not just be like her mom and to um, make a better life, you know, she got pregnant unexpectedly at a younger age, a younger the age that she wanted to. And, you know, that was hard on her um, until to this day at 30 years old. Um, it's still something that's hard on her. And so it's really helping um them to let go of that shame and guilt, um, you know, focus on what's, what, what are we doing now? Um, and that takes, you know, some, some work, again, to just really help to shift their mindset and help them to know that um, the future can be, better, uh, can be better for them um, and that their past mistakes don't define, don't define every action that they're making today. You can go ahead. Um, sometimes, like I was saying, um, a lot of former foster youth um, are feeling that blame, just feeling discouraged, worried, doubtful. Um, I know this is definitely with Christy often um, because to this day she's struggling with her financial issues and how she's able to um, make ends meet um, for her children and that can just just, just be really discouraging. Um, and so here are some affirmations that um, we share together when we're meeting with one another and that, um, you know, we have her to go ahead and say to herself regularly when she is feeling those moments, um, you know, it doesn't matter if I make a mistake, right? We all make mistakes. It happens. Um, I'm proud of myself for even trying and really having her to repeat things like that so that way that she can start to believe it and um, it can start to be true in her life. Um, and then some tools that we that we work together on or that um, you're able to work with are sometimes just like, let's go take a walk, let's get some fresh air, let's laugh. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it can be a TikTok video or a meme from Instagram or just like let's watch a short YouTube video or really asking them what makes them laugh and, you know, aligning with that, building that rapport, building that safe space so that way they can um, they can trust what you're saying, but then also you're doing it with them. So you're modeling that. So these are some tips and tools that you can do when they're feeling some of these feelings. You can go ahead. Um, the R is recognizing your why and your wishes. Um, again, like what I was saying, it's your why and your wishes. So often these former foster youth, they haven't had control over anything in their lives. Um, you know, their parents, the system have made decisions for them all over and over again. Um, people, their teachers have told them what they should do, what they can't do. Um, and so it's time to let them know, like, no, let's empower them to take that control over their lives and um, recognize what, um, why they want the things that they want and, um, you know, what are their hopes and dreams, you know? Oftentimes people haven't ever asked them what they really want out of life. So um, that's one of the steps. Go ahead. We can advance. Um, and with that, um, after we're, we're, we're bringing, we're to bring that vision to life on what their hopes and dreams, we have to set those SMART goals. Like really, um, if you haven't heard of SMART goals before, they're specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely goals um, for, for them. We want to make sure that, um, you know, we want to help them to dream. A lot of times, um, you know, former foster people who are living in poverty and have just had that cycle, they're just living in survival mode. They're really not able to think about the future. They're just think, able to think about you know, what's going to happen by the end of the day or how am I going to get through tomorrow? And so it takes a lot of encouragement to help them vision. But once we do that vision, we want to help them bring that to reality and help them set those goals. And so, you know, asking them things like, what is the goal, right? And then why is the goal important to you? Um, naming the problems that may come up because we know problems can come up when we're, when we're all trying to reach our goals. So, now that we're able to name them and see them, we can see ways that we can work around them and, you know, how we can work together in order to complete, to complete those goals. We can advance. Um, the E is embracing and reauthoring your money story. Um, a lot of times there's, again, a lot of shame, um, you know, guilt around their, their, childhood, their their money story, their life story. Um, oftentimes they have to repeat their story over and over again. So it's not just getting them to speak about what's happened to them. Um, it's about for them to recognize that, yes, these things have happened to you. Um, and But again, they don't necessarily have to come into the way that you are moving forward in your future. Yes, they built your character and who you are and 
who you are is amazing because of your story, um, but it doesn't have to limit you. And so, again, money problems happen, life happens, um, you know, to everyone. Um, just there's no point of blaming yourself or others for them. Um, you know, let's 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 work through it together, um, and then let's let's remind them to reclaim their power that they have the power to rewrite their own money story. Um, you know, with Chrissy, is constantly sharing like, yeah, you didn't get this growing up, right? It, it's a lot of um, hard feelings towards her mom or to the situation because she had to grow up faster than you know she did, and so when she's parenting her child. She's she's putting that on on her child also, and it's like no, let's um we can rewrite this. We don't have to do the same thing that we saw. Um, we can make our own traditions. We can make our own life, and um just just reminding her to reclaim her power and take control back over her life and her finances. You can go ahead. Um, and then reframing those limiting beliefs. We all have them, right? That voice in our head that are just that happens when we overthink and, you know, the mind plays tricks on us and it makes us worry about things and makes us create problems. And so instead of uh, using those, those, those negative feelings, right. To just add to those negative beliefs, to those limiting beliefs, um, encouraging them to see that money story as an opportunity to grow, right. Like compost, if anybody is a gardener or, you know, uh, if you're thinking about how plants grow, right. You're using all of that, the yucky stuff, the dirt, the trash, all that stuff um, in order to, to, to grow, right? All of that has made you who you are. And so um, when you're saying this right to them too, you want to believe it, right? We want to show them that we believe in them um, and to give them that hope that it's not, we're not just talking, right? We actually believe, I, I truly believe that Chrissy is one of the strongest people that I've ever met. And um, we'll, you know, she has a lot of goals for herself and will achieve all of them. <laughs> so I, um, when I'm saying that to her, I'm saying it like I mean it, so that way she can start believing it herself too. And just letting her know that all those feelings serve as a purpose to teach her. We can go ahead. And these are just some tips too for you all. Um, and like when you're helping them to reframe those limiting beliefs, um, there's a lot of different ways in order to do that. Obviously me just saying this to her is not gonna one time is not going to help. There are going to be some things. Again, I want to empower her. So I don't want, I want her to be able to take some skills that I'm giving to her and um, helping her to do that too. So some techniques we use is a thought journal. So whenever she's having one of those negative uh, thoughts, she can write it down and then just, you know, maybe in a few weeks, look back at it and say like, wait, is this actually true? Um, you know, putting things into perspective sometimes, like really, um, what is the worst thing can happen if I do try this or if I do ask for help in this way? What What's the worst thing can happen? Or also changing your thinking to, if I do this, what's the best thing that can happen? Um, and so helping, just really helping her and giving her some, some tools in order to reframe those limiting beliefs. And go ahead. Um, the... Second E is to ensure that your personal values align with your money goals, um, and that is huge. Most of the times, no one's asked us really what our values are. We go through our day-to-day -day life just moving um, and not knowing um, how much our values are intertwined in just like the jobs we pick, the relationships we choose, um, just the, the money decisions we make. So just knowing your values helps you to set goals that you are motivated to accomplish. Again, um, you know, when you know that, you know, you strongly value financial freedom, you may think twice about, you know, overspending the next time when you're feeling sad. Go ahead. Um, and again, like I was saying, um, just your values are really key to being able to set financial boundaries also. Um, you know, a lot of times with our former foster youth, even no matter what, for any person, um, probably that's even on this call, so it's not just with foster youth, um, we, we, still, we still have a love for our parents no matter what we went through and, so, um, and for our family. And so a lot of times we see with former foster youth that, um, you know, they see their family members, their friends, they're struggling also. And so when they do get funds or when they do start doing a little better, they start feeling some, um, some guilt about that. And they often will share their funds or share their little with, you know, them, which is, which is noble and it's amazing, but, you know, it's not really pushing their situation forward. And so it's really key for them to like set financial boundaries or, um, and in order to do that, they need to know their values. Go ahead. Um, D is dealing with debt and credit. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, many foster youth um, 
when they were in foster care, some of their social security numbers got stolen um, by by various people because their information is just out there. And so oftentimes they will, you know, the first time that they're checking their credit or see, or applying for credit, they see that they may have a bunch of debt or, you know, accounts that were opened in their names. And so um, you want to help them to request and review their annual credit report, look at their credit scores, help them to understand what credit is. And then, you know, even if they've made, they had their own credit um, mistakes and have gotten into debt, help them to build a plan um, to get out of that debt and to um, a debt repayment plan. Go ahead. Um, o is observing and assessing, observing and assessing your spending and saving habits. Um, you know, that's huge. This, this step usually takes a while, multiple steps um, in order for them to really look at and take a hard look at what they're spending their money on. Are they saving? What is their relationship with saving? Um, why are they spending the way that they're spending? Um, and to adjust it. And so this takes a lot of different steps, but it's so key so that they know, again, you can't get in control of your money without knowing like what your money is doing. So we want to make sure that they're making their money work for them, um, paying themselves first, you know, when they're getting money and, you know, helping them to just create a, a, a better pattern, right? It says that behaviors, we want them to start changing their behaviors, but without change, without understanding where your money is going and how much money you have coming in, um, you, it's, it's hard for you to change those behaviors. And go ahead. And the last and final step um, is to, and again, um, if, you, if when you're getting there, to make and maintain that fun financial freedom plan. I know in financial social work, um, we uh, limit how much we're using the B word, the budget, um, and because that can feel very limiting and feel hard, especially when uh, for people who already have a scarcity mindset or a lack mindset and are already thinking. So, you know, we try to we, we want to reframe that, right, for them. And so we're making a fun financial freedom plan. We're creating a plan to manage that debt, increase the income, um, savings, and their assets. Um, and again, this is not a linear process. Uh, we are working on all of it um, at different times, wherever they are, and meeting them where, where they are. Um, with Christy, we're working on a couple of these uh, to date um, at the same time. Um, what wherever wherever she is um but she is at a place where she is thinking differently you can tell in her her behaviors how she's making decisions she re she called me last week just to show me how she signed up for this new app to um, see where her money's going and to like cancel some subscriptions that she's making and so it's been a journey um and i'm there right alongside her doing it and um, i encourage you all to be able to do the same and that is it. We can advance to the last slide with just my information again. Thank you so much, Rita, again, and for you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. I have my website and my email address here um, if anyone wants to get in contact with me. Um, but really appreciate the time. Well, we loved having you, and you shared really good, important information with us. I am going to take oh i guess i don't have to take it back because i was advancing the slides that's funny so i need to put my slides back up okay hoping i can do that so sharing my very whoops okay so before we get into q and a i have a few final thoughts to share with everyone and i take advantage of this opportunity uh, to share these really important pieces of information and insight and understanding anytime um, i can so no one chooses to have money problems but we know that most people do but the good news is, and this is so important, no one can or needs to know everything about money, but everyone does need to know certain things about money. And that goes for foster youth, that goes for everyone in this training. Um, there are certain things that will make your life better when you know them. So everyone has a relationship with money and with self, 
and most need healed. Healing that relationship with self takes time, honesty, less self-criticism, and more self-love. Healing your relationship with your money does begin with your thoughts, feelings, attitudes, values, experiences with money. When we talk about money, what are we really talking about? Understand that's why this is so hard for foster youth and for most people. We are talking about survival, safety, and security. <coughs> and we're talking about power because those who have the money have the power. So everything Tyon has shared with us today is about empowering youth who have aged out of the foster system and not been taught so many of these tools and skills. We want to share this with them and empower them to do better. We want everyone to never or always keep working to make peace and make friends with your money. When you blame money for all of your problems, it's just an excuse to avoid dealing with those problems, the stress and the trauma. And if we want to stop raising generation after generation of financially illiterate men and women, we have to start by preparing our own children and grandchildren for the real world by teaching them about money. And we want to reduce the relationship between finances and suicide because that shouldn't and doesn't have to be a death sentence. Always choose life. And a few resources for you. Next month, we have the uh, chief educator from Experian, um, the credit score agency. Every year, he updates us all on what's new with credit scores. And there's always something new with credit scores. And then in September for our free monthly webinar, we will um, have the speaker on what to know about student loans and debt before, during, and after college. You should also know that since last year, we've had a financial health and wellness professional community. Uh, it is a membership organization for financial professionals who are work with clients to overcome money challenges and help them build wealth. The community prides, provides financial professionals with the opportunity to interact, learn, network, connect, expand client resources, and support each other across diverse client populations. And it's open to everyone. Uh, on her website, we have a partner program. If you are logged in and you click on the dollar sign next to the cart, uh, you can earn a 10% commission. And the person who purchases this, uh, any of our products uh, with your code, because it is a unique code for you, that person gets a 10% discount. We have lots of wonderful essays from our graduates on our website. And we currently are offering a pay what you can for the financial social work certification because we do know that these are challenging financial times. The certification, our graduates have six months to complete it. It is self-study and self-paced includes everything, all the materials, plus the final exam and a beautiful frameable certificate. And there is a three year renewal plan. So do we have questions, Linda? Um, you will see that Piana's information is also up here if you would like to contact her. Linda. Yes, uh, we have two questions. And um, Tayana, I just want to thank you for not only such great information, but your own personal tenacity 
Um, go to meeting did not give us a linear experience today. We had some audio issues and Tiana really pushed through them. So thank you. First question for you. Systemic issues seem to run so deep in the US. So how can I personally support foster youth to stay hopeful while facing so many inequalities in the system? Thank you so much, Linda. Yes, we made it work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> we did it, we did it. But yes, I, I love the question. Um, really, it's about just reminding yourself, reminding them just to like, let's again, take it down and work with the individual. So I'm um, really helping that foster youth to develop, again, it's all about empowering, empowerment. So making them aware, educating them about the systemic issues. And when they're feeling frustrated about something, right, that um, this housing program is not getting back to them or they're not able to get childcare because they're making this amount of money, explain to them what the systemic, um, what the systemic issue is behind that, right, educating them. And then also just empowering them to advocate for themselves and let them know that they have a voice and um, there's different people that they can communicate with in order to get their needs met, right? And sometimes there's different um, government uh, government opportunities for them to sit on, on the board. I, I love doing that and giving them some type of leadership skills or helping them to really just use their voice. Um, and helping them to figure out how to just best navigate that system, you know, different key words to say when navigating um, with a community partner or with a resource or, um, you know, especially when it comes to navigating with the Department of Children and Family Services, you know, giving them, let them know what, what DCFS is looking for, what they need to say, how often they need to respond to them um, so that they, they know all that information and can um, utilize that to, to get their needs met. Awesome, thank you so much. I believe this next question might be for you, Rita. Someone is asking for more information on the financial health and wellness professional community. Okay, um, what that is actually is the opportunity for those of us working with clients experiencing financial problems, anxiety, stress, trauma. We meet several times a month through Zoom um, to build our own personal networks, to meet people with similar client populations, to do case studies, to just keep moving forward. Um, this important area of financial health and wellness it needs addressed. Things are worse for most people than possibly ever before. And by learning and talking together, we have the opportunity to create a safe space, which is so important in all the work we do. Uh, but particularly since it's 2023 and we still don't talk about money um, in a healthy way, and we need to, and we need to create a safe, non-judgmental space, um, certainly where clients can learn and talk about money. And the same thing is true for those of us who work with the clients. I see a question in here that I would love, and I know it's three o'clock, I would love Hayana to answer. Robin asked, what is a money wound? I love that. <laughs> I love that. So um, money wound is um, wound. I, I use wound a lot of other professions by using wound. Just another way to say trauma, right? Trauma can feel really hard um, for some people and it can um, it can kind of, especially when you're talking about it with people who have experienced it, right? Um, sometimes we don't even want to like own up to the different trauma, but we all have wounds, right? We all get injured sometimes. We all, um, uh, yeah, something something happens, right? And so a wound is letting us know like it's something, but it wounds heal, right? Um, you know, they go through a process and so can your trauma. And so it's just another way, again, to reframe it to just a little bit more positive way of thinking about something so hard that um, that we all have money wounds, um, and but we can definitely uh, heal from it, right? So money trauma is real, but so is healing. So 
Um, I love that question. It's just another way to reframe it and um, share, especially when you're dealing with people who have just been impacted by so much trauma and they've heard that word and it's, it's been something that uh, has been used to describe them. Um, it's just a different way of kind of uh, speaking about it. I love your answer and I think it is a perfect answer for closing out this wonderful training that you provided for us. I can see in chat just how, or I guess it's the question box, how many people um, said thank you for this wonderful training, Tiana. We really appreciate it. And we plan to have you back next year for one of your 10 coin trainings. And everybody, we hope to see you back next month at our monthly free webinar. Thanks and enjoy the rest of your day.